Greetings, VCF West. <clears throat> My name is Guy Fedorko. I'm sorry I can't be there in person today, as I'm sure we all are. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit today about what we've been doing to recover software work from uh, a machine called Whirlwind, developed in the 50s, about 60 years ago uh, at MIT. Um, this work has been done um, with help from both Computer History Museum and the MIT Museum uh, at CHM. Of course, I'm indebted to uh, Len Schustick and Dag Spicer and David Brock, as well as Al Coso. And at MIT, uh, I've been working with uh, uh, Debbie Douglas and, oh, Debbie, a debt of gratitude. As I said, this is about a machine called Whirlwind. Um, uh, we <clears throat> set about this project to try and recover some of the software from the machine that was designed first run in uh, 1949, early 1950. So what is this machine whirlwind? It's a one-of-a-kind vacuum tube computer. First came into operation in 1949 and was available for research use at MIT <clears throat> starting in about 1951, running through the end of the decade. Um, the project began under a contract from the Navy. Uh, their initial problem was to design a real-time flight simulator, uh, and they decided that a computer was just the thing they needed to do that, as opposed to uh, using analog, a digital computer, as opposed to using analog computers as would normally have been done. Um, the machine evolved to take on roles in air traffic control as well as uh, air defense work, as we'll see. Um, it was designed as a 16-bit parallel architecture with 2,000 words of address space. Uh, it was capable of about 50,000 ads per second, which uh, in the context was pretty darn quick. Um, the program is remembered uh, even though it was not commercialized uh, directly as Whirlwind. The program is remembered for developing um, magnetic core memory. Uh, many were working on it, but it was the Whirlwind team who's usually credited with getting core memory, uh, as they say, reduced to practice and uh, reliable and practical. Um, the project was a research project and was continually evolving. Um, uh, by 1952, um, many of the staff members had moved from the original whirlwind development on to uh, an Air Force funded contract, which ultimately became SAGE, Semi-Automated Ground Environment uh, Air Defense uh, Network. Um, but while the machine was at MIT, there were many other applications that ran on the machine, many in the broad field of applied mathematics. Um, the machine ran for about a decade and was decommissioned uh, in the spring of 1959. Um, There's a photograph of the well-known photograph of the control room for Whirlwind. I always like to think of this as a computer out of the central casting <clears throat> for a science fiction movie. It was wires and racks and cables and uh, all kinds of stuff bolted together to try and get a machine that would work. Um, you can see in the lower right hand of the slide uh, an artist sketch, uh, including some of the machine room, uh, including five rows of racks full of equipment to implement this one 16-bit computer. Um, Black diagram for the machine uh, in modern days looks surprisingly conventional. Um, it was a von Neumann architecture, even though Mr. von Neumann had only uh, published his first draft in June of 1945. Um, the machine used what you might think of as a simple load store architecture. It was centered around an accumulator. Uh, and core memory with a few other registers for the usual things, you know, program counters, uh, I.O. register. Um, the ALU was uh, a 16-bit ALU, but uh, a second 16-bit register attached to it for overflow and underflow from um, op operations like uh, multiply and shift. Uh, the machine was large. Um, 
in terms of square feet and power. It was about 100 kilowatts of stuff. Uh, the, the computer room itself was 2,500 square feet uh, with more stuff on the floor below this for uh, drum storage and more stuff in the basement for power supplies. Um, it, the machine actually maps to its block diagram pretty clearly on the floor plan. Um, you can see there are 16 racks there labeled A0 through A15. Those are the accumulator, the ALU basically accumulator, A and B registers, program counter. Um, uh, racks E0 through E15 are memory. Uh, and, and they started with uh, electrostatic storage tube memory. Um, uh, and then there's another row of 16 racks which contain um, other flip-flop storage and comparison registers and a few other odds and ends. Um, I always like to think of <coughs> the comparison of Whirlwind to other machines. Of course, comparison with a modern machine, it's uh, it is roughly equivalent to a rather slow Arduino, um, uh, approximately two kilowatts of storage. Um, the uh, <clears throat> mass storage was about 24, 24k words for Whirlwind, and, and of course you don't get that much space inside an Arduino. Uh, Arduino is a lot faster though, two million or so operations per second. Um, the cost was a little different. Uh, if you compare the cost per ad per second, of course, it's about a million times less expensive to run an Arduino. Um, but uh, an interesting comparison is also made against the computing environment at the time. Uh, in the late 1940s, um, the biggest computing enterprise in the world was a thing called the Math Tables Project run by the US government, um, which at its peak uh, had about 450 human calculators who would use pencil and paper or editing machines to uh, carry out computations for mathematical tables, logarithmic tables, and so on. Um, the Math Tables Project cost about half a million dollars a year in 1940, uh, which <clears throat> made Whirlwind uh, uh, definitely better, uh, but not by the number of orders of magnitude that you might expect. So the Whirlwind designers were doing it partly because they wanted real time, partly because they were visionary and saw what could be done with the technology. So what's this whirlwind recovery pilot project? Um, the MIT Museum has many whirlwind documents. Uh, there are hundreds of reports, training manuals, um, engineering drawings, notebooks. Uh, at the same time, uh, CHM has in its archive hundreds of paper tapes. Um, and, uh, and about 100 magnetic tapes. Um, both of the museums have some physical artifacts, although the bulk of the machine was destroyed around 1970 at the end of its useful life, somewhat past the end of its useful life. Um, so the question, of course, we asked was, could we combine all of these resources uh, and learn something about the early evolution of software development? Uh, and in the process, can we somehow make the material accessible to non-specialists who don't want to wade through 2,000 documents of scanned uh, whirlwind reports? So how did programmers program in 1950? Um, at the beginning of the whirlwind program, <clears throat> it was a completely manual process. Programmers would write out the code uh, on sheets of paper, uh, transcribe it onto coding sheets. Um, they manually assigned instructions and data locations. Uh, typists would type the program into paper tape and using a checker, a checker machine to type it a second time and catch the errors. Um, 
if you were a Navy or Air Force programmer, you got to work in the daytime, but anyone else, you got the night shift. So you get some unpleasant time to come in in the morning, early or middle of the night to run your program on the machine. Of course, you run it, it crashes, you panic, you make a patch tape, try to make a patch tape to fix the error, and then repeat until you get kicked out of the machine room for the next job. Um, they rapidly discovered that this programming stuff was actually kind of difficult and that uh, it was actually worth wasting <coughs> computer minutes on uh, catching errors and compiling and assembling code. So there was quite a bit of work done on a set of tools that come to be known as the comprehensive system to provide uh, uh, a little bit more friendly environment for uh, creating code to run on this machine. Um, paper tape was the, the medium for whirlwind. Um, <clears throat> they used seven track tape and a machine called a flexo writer to punch the tape, read the tapes and uh, print uh, and later in the program to type commands into the computer. For the most part, it was um, the machine was operated as one might expect from an analog computer uh, background was operated by buttons and switches and knobs and lights, but eventually developed something that was kind of like an operating system. Uh, so what about recovering this media? Um, we've started on recovering most of the, 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 the material that's in the archive. Um, uh, Al Coso has read almost 800 paper tapes using a, a modern paper tape reader. And <clears throat> Al and Len together have been working on recovering magnetic tapes. Of those, we've, we've read about 60 of the 100 magnetic tapes. Um, that has resulted in hundreds of uh, potential executable programs for Whirlwind. Uh, many are diagnostics and utilities. Uh, a number of them are uh, demo programs. Um, we have not yet found much by way of air defense, but may, may not be too surprising since it was probably classified at the time. Um, documentation for software was uh, not kind of the thing that was done. Um, so matching up project reports and memos with the binary object is still hit or miss. We found a few cases where there's a program which is accurately described in a memo. Um, and we have not yet found the one index that ruled the tape department. Uh, I know there was one. They were very careful about numbering tapes, but we have not yet found that index. Uh, so a lot of it is still guesswork to figure out what these things are. Um, as I mentioned, they, the, the project produced quite a few documents. Um, we have found the librarian's document catalog, that is the, the listing of all of the documents produced by the Whirlwind project. And it runs to some 8,000 titles over the 10-year the period of the program. Um, uh, some years ago, MITRE scanned about 1,800 of these documents. Uh, which are available at MIT. Uh, and uh, BitSavers carries about 280 of the documents, some of which overlap the MIT collection and some of which are different. There's also some, uh, some documents as a Smithsonian and MITRE has, still has thousands of photos from the Whirlwind project. So how do you recover this stuff? I think the tool chain is not too surprising. Um, you start on the left-hand side with <clears throat> uh, uh, an image of the tape, either magnetic tape or uh, paper tape. Um, there is a decoder, which has been quite problematic and challenging because the tape formats changed a lot. Um, but there's a decoder which reads the tape and reassembles it in what would have been the memory format that it would uh, land in, in a whirlwind memory to run. 
Um, I can then disassemble that to see what the code looks like, uh, add comments and labels, reassemble it and run it in the simulator. So one can then uh, uh, form a loop of run a simulator, see what it does, figure it out a little bit, add a few labels, reassemble it, figure out the next step. So what have we recovered so far? There's uh, quite a few bits and pieces. Um, the <clears throat> one of the famous demos for Whirlwind is a simple program that ran on the on the machine and displayed on an oscilloscope on the large radar display oscilloscopes that they used um, simply to calculate the dynamic path of a bouncing ball. Um, this program actually was unique in its own way at the time. Uh, because it was actually solving these equations in real time right there in front of you. You could see the output of the program as it was drawn on the oscilloscope. Um, and it solves the, solved the thing at about the same speed that you'd expect a, a, an ordinary ball to bounce. Um, we have recovered a, a parlor trick. Um, uh, <clears throat> there was a tape labeled Jingle Bells, which in fact is the source or was the program which produced the uh, scrap of music that was played in uh, at the end of the Edward R. Murrow interview of Jay Forrester um, uh, at the at the in the Whirlwind Lab. Um, you can find that still online on a video. Uh, the program was called See It Now and was uh, aired December 1951. Um, there's a game of blackjack. We'll see the screen for that the, on the next slide, I think. Um, uh, this one, as far as I can tell, was a completely unofficial piece of work. Um, we have found no documentation at all, um, but it runs well enough to play a credible game of, uh, of blackjack. Um, a couple other programs which are puzzling. Um, there's uh, there are a number of test programs, and sometimes it's not obvious what they're testing. There's a thing called Pad Game which runs perfectly well, and I have no idea what they wrote it for. Um, there are a variety of test programs. There are quite a few more uh, diagnostics that we hope to get running to, uh, if nothing else, to shake out the bugs in the simulation. Um, I'm working on a polynomial solver. Again, that, that was one that uh, ran in the um, in some of the videos <coughs> of Whirlwind in its uh, early days. Um, and another program used to impress dignitaries by calculating dates on calendars. Um, this is the screen from the blackjack program. You can see the display is uh, lean and a little spare. The hardware would draw uh, seven segment characters on the screen, but with a little creativity, you could turn those into, some of those into letters, which if you know what you're gonna read, you can kind of read. Um, so uh, this was actually an interactive game. The, the Whirlwind developed a thing they called the light gun um, we would now call a light pen, and of course, is easily emulated with a mouse and a screen. Um, so there are a number of hotspots on the screen. You could hit the hotspot to create, uh, to cause the game to move to its next step. Um, obviously, normally you would hit the, um, you would click the the hits button or the sands button to uh, advance the the game and uh, and try to win against the machine. Um, this, uh, I should say, I should say thank you to Ken Sharif, who uh, many of you would know, who translated some of the uh, simulator into JavaScript. So if you go to his website with the URL here, you can actually run this game in your web browser and play a, a, play a game against, uh, against Whirlwind. Uh, and if you find a bug, um, uh, we'll dig up the phone number for the uh, Whirlwind help desk. You can give that a try. So uh, this work is ongoing. Um, <clears throat> we have recovered a few things. As you've seen, most of the things we've recovered have been relatively straightforward. 
uh, standalone programs, uh, of course, because uh, uh, we have not yet tried to recover uh, comprehensive system uh, directors, tapes, or anything that uh, resembles operating system material. Um, and we have not yet tried to uh, to recover the language, uh, the language tools. Um, but I think they're there on the tapes uh, and ready to be uh, sought. Um, of course, we fix, we keep fixing simulation bugs. Um, uh, a tool to visualize program flow would be really helpful. We started on that. It needs uh, it needs a lot more work to help us see what's going on inside these mysterious programs. Um, there is material published on air defense, and I'd like to find more work on that because this r really was the the trial uh, of the proof of concept for the SAGE program. And SAGE, of course, turned into a very large program uh, of the US Air Force, uh, which um, <clears throat> really advanced the state of the art in computing. Finally, there are uh, all kinds of interesting people stories in here. The Whirlwind Project seeded lots of different startups uh, as Whirlwind team members uh, uh, moved on to other activities. Um, uh, one, of course, well-known case is Ken Olson and Harlan Anderson. Both worked on Whirlwind uh, as young engineers and went on to form Digital Equipment Corporation. And we owe DEC a uh, debt of gratitude for helping, in fact, to save the remnants of Whirlwind that we have now. Finally, uh, here is uh, here are a few websites and and um, resources if you're interested in looking into any of this further. Um, BitSavers and and the MIT Dome system have many of the documents. Um, uh, Al has posted the many of the tape images on BitSavers, and uh, my simulator work is uh, is published on GitHub. So if anyone is interested, drop us a note. And with that, I would like to say thank you very much and switch back to the rest of the VCF program. Thanks everyone for listening.